gentlemen hearty welcome to one day seminar on practical aspects of insolvency bankruptcy code 2016 and amendment bill 2019 friends uh, to inaugurate uh, this one day seminar we are fortunate to have advocate uh, vivekanand is with us and also our first technical session speaker Gopal Krishna Raju is also with us, and our uh, second technical session speaker, Advocate Danpal, is also joined us. Now I request the uh, brand chairman to escort uh, our chief guest for the day, and also first technical session uh, speaker, Gopal Krishna Raju, join us in the dais. I request our chairman welcome uh, our chief guest with a floor booking. Please welcome my uh, advocate Vekana. Also request uh, to welcome uh, Gopal Raju. Thank you, chairman. Now I request our chairman to make welcome address. Thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, today's program. 
friends, uh, as we move forward, a couple of further programs are lined up. One of the very important programs I would like to mention is about the Parishirana. Parishirana is there on uh, 17th and 18th. This is the conference, annual conference. And I request all of you to register for the conference. You might be wondering why this is called Parishirana. Parishirana is uh, introspection. You need to check yourself, you know. Whether the entire system, what you have learned so far, what you have done so far, everything went right or something went wrong, is there an area for improvement, was there some weakness, how to strengthen that, what is the way forward, you know, it's, it's an introspection and setting the goal for the next year. That's why I call, we call it as name it as Parishirana and uh, this is going to be twofold, one is the GST part and the other one is the next generation digital accountant. Industry 4.0 next uh, revolution is happening and all of us need to gear up to the next level therefore we thought let us have one day a uh, program on the next gen digital accounting course also. Request all of you to make use of the opportunity. Friends as you know uh, every year we need to need some drinks because we have been continuously working every day and night without break. Therefore we thought we will have one program um, in a forest with the Vana Bhojana. You like Vana Bhojana? So register for the program, Vanabhojana is there on the Sahyadri Sambrama which is happening in Sirsi and the Vanabhojana program is going to be uh, held in uh, a place called Yana, I don't know how many of you have heard, have heard of Yana. Yana is the place uh, where Basmasura had uh, done his tapas and uh, Ishwara gave the boon. Uh, you know what is the boon? If he puts his hand on anybody's head, uh, that person will become ash. That was the boon. And Shiva gave the vara. <laughs> and uh, Basmasura wanted to test it on Shiva only. And Shiva started running. He got into a cave and hidden himself there. Vishnu came in the form of Mohini, started dancing and slowly, somehow with uh, the you know, gimmicks of dancing, somehow he was able to put uh, Basmasura's uh, hand in his head only and he got uh, into ash. That too has happened in Yana. Therefore, we have two towers there. One is uh, Kala Bhairaveshwara Tower, which is 120 meter height, and the next tower is Mohini Tower. Mohini Tower is 90 meter height, and there is a Swayambhu, that means uh, Shiva Linga is self. Uh, uh, yes, so available so, there, and it's a, it's a very nice uh, historical place to visit also. I request you to register for that program. Uh, friends, uh, you know why we wanted to have a, a, you know, a workshop on the a bankruptcy code today is because uh, as you know, this is an opportunity open to many chartered accountants and hardly few chartered accountants are actually getting into this area. We wanted to see having 13,500 chartered accountants in Bangalore, why not at least 130 chartered accountants get into a real uh, hardcore uh, practice in, under the insolvency and bankruptcy code, how to get there. Therefore, we thought, you know, anyway, eminent lawyers are already there, many company secretaries are already there. Why can't we take help of them and uh, let us get there? That's the reason we wanted to have uh, today's program because uh, things are changing, audit is no more uh, that, uh, you know, interesting sweet spot nowadays because, you know, I and FS, what's happening, you know, how big force are also getting into trouble. And I have seen many corporate chartered accountants for me have given up their statute audit. And they wanted to focus on the consulting business. We need to open up new and new opportunities. Therefore, when the opportunities are available in the market, why should not we grab and why should not we get ourselves equipped and be there? That's the reason we wanted to have to this program. I'm sure this is going to be a very good learning opportunity for all of you. Uh, once again, I welcome each one of you for the today's program. Happy learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, for a fabulous time. Welcome, Andres. Friends, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our chief guest uh, to this August gathering. Advocate S. Vivekanan graduated from uh, University Law College, Bangalore in the year 2000. Presently, is a partner of VGB Associates, a law firm in Bangalore. He is uh, presently focusing on practice in the High Court and uh, corporate matters, predominantly mergers, reconstruction and restructuring of companies besides the corporate litigation relating to minority shareholders' operation and mismanagement of companies, 
company prosecutions, insolvency and bankruptcy matters and commercial arbitration. He is a regular faculty of, he is also a member of uh, Institute of Company Secretaries of India. He is a regular faculty in the Institute of Company Secretaries of India and also addressed uh, various workshops there. He is also into organizing moot court comp competitions, model parliament uh, competitions and orientation programs and uh, candidates taking uh, judges exams. He is a trustee of Lahari Law Academy which is into improving and developing the quality and standards of advocates. He is a regular uh, speaker in various uh, seminars and uh, conferences across India. More than that, an enchanting personality, see uh, educate Vivekanand. With this brief intro, I present him before you. Please join me to one to the Friends, uh, it is my pleasure once again to introduce our uh, first technical section speaker, CA Dr. Gopal Krishna Raju. Gopal Krishna Raju is uh, from a family of uh, chartered accountants. Uh, his father, mother, brother, wife, all are chartered accountants from Chennai. He is a three term SARC member from 2010 to 2019. He has uh, many qualifications, uh, including uh, ICWA and uh, insolvency professional, valuation professional, and associate member of ICSI. Twin postgraduate diploma holder in operation research and financial management too, and many others. In my MPhil from management from Tamil Nadu Open University. He is a advisory board member of many reputed institutes, including Loyola College, Chennai, DG Vaishnava College, Chennai, STNB Vaishnava College of Women, Autonomous University in Chennai, SIBT College, Chennai and board member of Director General of Audit, Central Chennai, Center for Entrepreneurial Development, Anna University, Chennai, and also a steering committee member of Institute of Directors, Chennai, a passionate writer on technology and taxation in numerous journals and newspapers, a regular panelist in TV shows, as a versatile speaker, GKR have addressed more than 300 plus meetings of GST to various forums including professional bodies, Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Trade Associations, both in English and Tamil. More than that, a fascinating personality, GKR. With this brief introduction, I present him before you. Please join me to welcome him. Friends, uh, let us uh, seek Almighty's blessing through lighting the lamp. May request our, uh, our te second technical speaker, uh, Danpal, also join us in that uh, lighting uh, the lamp process. Thank you. 
friends, Almighty blessed us. Now I request that our chief guest to address us. A very good morning to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to be in your midst for the inauguration of the one day workshop on the practical aspects of Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. I thank the organizers for inviting me to share my views on the topic, apart from being a part of the uh, inauguration with you. Now, I must say we are all aware of the fact that the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court was brought in with a specific purpose to ensure that there is credit availability in the system, the economic system. Because we know once a company gets into winding up or once it is the uh, uh, it falls into the category of an NPA or a distressed asset, the funds get stuck, the creditors don't get anything, the workmen are stuck, the entrepreneur is stuck for life, he cannot move on in his career. So to do to ensure that there is a resolution to all these aspects, the IBC was introduced. And this is the main purpose. With this object in mind, I must very frankly say the authorities could be the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, the uh, uh, authorities, the uh, Athlete Authority, the NCLT, or probably even the, you know, the uh, Supreme Court. They are all keeping this, these aspects in mind and they are going ahead. Some of the major benefits that we can now feel is the availability of credit because of quick bringing into the system of funds and where the process gets resolved, the entrepreneur is free to go and move on with his career <coughs> and we can also see that there is a balance, I must say to a great extent there is a balancing of interest of all the stakeholders, could be creditors, could be probably among the creditors, between the creditors you have the financial and the operation creditors, there is a great balance done. Of course, there could be situations where certain section of the stakeholders feel that they have been let down. Like how it happens at times with the operational creditors. But given the system, given the situation, what best could be done is being done. We know for a fact that at times operational creditors don't get any, uh, no, anything. And probably even the financial creditors don't get everything that they probably intend to recover. And they only get pro-rata payments. Now, this being the situation, <coughs> I would still say the IBC is on track, it's perfectly in place and we hear a lot of you know, voice which says that there are too many amendments. So let us accept the fact that this is the only legislation up to date where you have had the maximum number of amendments, quick placed changes in terms of regulations, you have rules coming in frequently, regulations being introduced frequently. Now, probably what would have happened if this had not happened? I'm sure you would not. You would have actually seen this legislation get stuck in a place. It would have probably fallen in line with the other legislations. Now, I'll give you a small example. Now, we know for a fact that once the petition is admitted, could be Section 7 petition by the financial creditor or operational creditor under Section 9, once it is admitted, the uh, interim resolution professional is appointed. He is having he, he is given 30 days time to ensure that he constitutes a committee of cred creditors, and then the uh, charge is given over to the resolution professional. The resolution professional takes it over. He's got uh, you know time. Overall time is around 270 days. Extension is given up to 270 days. 70 days. This was the position. Now what started happening? Now we see, you know, you actually now see that a lot of basic principles are settling down. There was dispute with regard to the term dispute. What is dispute? What is not dispute? Dispute is an inclusive definition. Now this went up to uh, it, it, it was challenged before the NCL80. Uh, you know, probably if you look at the uh, case law, Kiruza versus Mobilox uh, software, and then it again went up to the Supreme Court. Now what happened now, let us say it was settled down, the basic principles were settled down, but what happened in the process? A lot of cases, you know, the high courts and the various courts, tribunals, stayed the matters and granted uh, stay orders and uh, gave some interim orders. 
in the process the very purpose was probably getting defeated because there was an outer time limit of 270 days now what happens where time exceeded 270 days I must say, you know, I have myself filed applications before the tribunal telling that there was a stay by the High Court or the tribunal on account of which this period has to be excluded. Now what happened? You know, the whole process started, you know, extending beyond 270 days. Realizing that this would not work, the government, they uh, brought about a legislation which clearly said that the outer limit is 330 days, no matter what, 270 days things have to close. If it doesn't close, you have an outer limit of 330 days and if things don't happen till 330th day, it gets into liquidation no matter what. If there is a irrespective of whether there is a stay, no stay, there is an appeal pending, it doesn't matter. If things don't happen within 330 days, it's getting into liquidation. So, in fact, I still remember, you know, we had a doubt whether things would happen because time limits are laid down in many legislations. Is it possible to do it here? But actually, I must say, the Insolvency Board of India, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, they are actually bringing in rules and regulations to ensure that it happens and it is happening. You may say that they are coming up with so many rules, how do we keep ourselves up uh, updated? Let me tell you friends, we are in a zone where things are changing and there are a lot of exigencies, there are a lot of business requirements. Probably some mistakes <coughs> have crept in at the time of probably bringing in the loss and probably there was a necessity to update it or probably there is a requirement to change depending upon the circumstances because of which there were rules brought in, regulations brought in and let me tell you, this is the only legislation where you had so many changes, a really uh, fast paced uh, development and I can assure you, you will still have amendments brought in, you will still have rule regulations being brought in, I'll tell you why. Now we know, we have the uh, you know, we have various rules and regulations. Now, what is the next uh, development that probably we look at it? Uh, uh, next biggest development that we look at? You have the cross-border insolvency. You will have rules, you will have regulations, you will have amendments to make to ensure that that is brought in, in line with the requirements. So, there is no point in blaming, telling that there are too many amendments, too many case laws. I must say that this is required for a legislation of this sort but for which the law would not have developed. Now, there were questions which cropped up as to whether the Limitation Act is applicable. It was laid down because there was no point in the statute, in the court, which said whether the Limitation Act is applicable or not. Then the case laws were laid down telling Limitation Act is applicable and the Act was amended, the court was amended. So we see that over a period of time, each of the authorities, the NCLT, the NCLAT, the Supreme Court, the IBBI have all played a very uh, important role in settling the legal position. Now, we are also aware that recently, home buyers have also been considered as financial creditors. You also see that authorized representative, we had a problem in JP Simmons case where different authorized representatives of the financial creditors voted in different manners creating a lot of confusion. So this was laid down, bringing in a provision which said that a 50% you know, decision by a particular sector or section of the financial creditor is the uh, vote or probably the authorized representative has to vote in the lines of the decision by more than 50% of the uh, uh, members of a particular financial creditor. So this, these are changes which have been brought in. And we also see that to some extent protection has been given to operational creditors where resolution plans are being finalized. Now there were a lot of complaints that operational creditors are not being given the required protection because as we see they, are, they don't have a voice in the committee of creditors. So it was felt that there is a requirement for bringing <coughs> protection to, the, uh, uh, to protect the interest of the operational creditors. And the biggest thing that has now come in is, with effect from 1st of December, is the personal guarantee or corporate guarantee. Where we see personal guarantors can be brought in and their uh, guarantees can be invoked by filing applications before the National Company Law Tribunal. Now the rules have been laid down, we have the forms, we are required to issue a notice 
prior to initiation of any application before the National Company Law Tribunal. Now, there could be various instances where a corporate debtor could have many guarantors to support the uh, debt. Does the uh, petitioner or the creditor have a choice to pick and choose the personal guarantors? The answer is yes. He can pick and choose and specifically issue notices and then file applications picking and choosing the guarantors. And then there could be a lot of issues probably which may require settling down when it comes to actual uh, litigation. Now probably issues could arise as to whether a personal guarantor could stand to the benefit of the entire financial creditor because the other financial creditors could also benefit where you bring in the personal guarantor. The main intention of bringing in personal guarantors is to ensure that the whole settlement process moves at a faster pace. The recoveries happen at a faster pace because now if you actually see the position prior to December 1st, it was this. You have the petition filed against the corporate debtor. The corporate debtor uh, you know, his assets, you probably get orders as against his assets. The RP or the IRP takes measures to protect the assets of the corporate debtor. He also probably takes steps to uh, ensure that the company goes on as a going concern. But in the meanwhile, you have the personal guarantors or the corporate debtors who do everything possible to uh, avoid or hide or probably reduce the value of the, the assets which are given as guarantee. Now this would ensure that that doesn't happen and not only that there is another possibility which we do see where the uh, guarantors are relaxed and for the most part the guarantors are directors. So they are not very much inclined or probably they don't take all the effort to ensure uh, and bring about a settlement. So they are relaxed but now with the introduction of this provision where personal guarantors are also brought in the directors and the guarantors take every possible step to ensure that the, the uh, um, CIRP is actually brought to a closure. We either know that if the CIRP will result in recovery of the money or probably there is, ensure that there is uh, some amount of satisfaction or hope that the creditors will get their money quickly or you know that it will get into liquidation. So it hastens the process completely. And the other amendment which was brought out in 2019 is where the recent amendment states that the resolution professional is required to take steps for continuing the company as a going concern basis. He, has, he is required to ensure that the licenses, permits, the concessions granted to the company are kept alive. He has to ensure that these are renewed to ensure that the company goes on as a going concern basis. And he should also take steps to ensure that the substratum of the company is not lost. So he is given uh, extra duties to ensure that this is done. And apart from this, where there is uh, CIRP or where there is a liquidation, there are provisions made by virtue of amendment, amendments where there could be a merger or a demerger for the purpose of ensuring that it helps in taking things forward in a better manner and to ensure that there is maximization of the value of the corporate debtors assets. So these are some of the uh, developments and developments which have happened recently and I am sure we have a lot of things to come in future and let us keep our you know, uh, mind open to uh, take all these things in the right spirit and the right perspective because this is required. Changes are required and we must accept the truth. Change is natural. Change is permanent. So let's accept it and let's take it up. And I must say to the members present here that practice in the area of insolvency and bankruptcy code is very rewarding, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of satisfaction. It gives you immense satisfaction because we are settling down the law. We are giving a lot of relief and we are playing our part in the uh, uh, objective, in the object of the legislation. Now probably we may think probably that we are doing a very small role but each professional matters and I must say this is a legislation where all the professionals have a role to play. We have valuation experts, we have uh, experts for, uh, for deciding on various aspects and all the professionals have to come together and 
the expertise that you have can actually be used if you actually appear before the National Company or Tribunal and Appellate Tribunals. So with these few words, I request all of you to kindly take advantage of the wonderful you know, uh, work, workshop that, have been, that has been structured for you. I did uh, see the uh, structure of the sessions and the structure of the workshop. It is, uh, you know, rightly, the topics have been rightly selected and we have expert and expertise, uh, experienced speakers on the topic. With these few words, I wish you all the best for in all your future endeavors and request you to please start practicing before the NCLT in large numbers. With these few words, I thank you. Thank you, Vivekanand, for your uh, wonderful speech to share your views on uh, IBC, including the latest uh, amendments. Please thank our guest with a lot of things. Friends, uh, it is our honor to felicitate him on this occasion. I request a dignitary from the Lions to do it. Thank you very much. Let us continue with our technical session. Request the GKR to take it forward.